comprehensive and all the records were available and up to date. And that couldn't be further from the truth. And he would not return the man's property even though he was told to pick it up. Because it showed that another person that he had purchased a firearm through French Creek Outfitters and that materials in, in the documentation, it showed that it was transferred legitimately through a dealer and the state police still recorded it as that previous owner had the, was the latest owner of the firearm in the PIC system. Why is that? We cannot have a system that's supposed to review these records and be considered to be accurate if it's not going to be and citizens are going to run afoul of this system and have to drive two and three and four hours to try to retrieve records or get an attorney and that's what Mr. Ross had to do. In this case where it's shown to be wrong, there's no civil remedies for a citizen. How do you make yourself whole for the monies you spend when it wasn't your fault? These are issues that I believe need to be addressed and so does our organization. And I might add that the National Shooting Sports Foundation uh, is opposed to the continuation of the PIC system as is every major sportsman's group in Pennsylvania. Um, the other issue is compliance with the law. Now, some of you senators may know that we sued the state police and the PIC system years ago uh, over the maintenance of the record of sale database. This was based on not only our interpretation of the law, but also of the audit that was done by the federal government in 2001 where they said they were not in compliance with federal law. As a point of contact state, they're supposed to comply with federal law and these records cannot be maintained and yet they are being maintained and Michael Ross's example is a perfect case in point. I have hundreds more in my files, hundreds of them, but I figured you didn't need any more documentation so I'm trying to be kind. Um, in the Sieges letter, they specifically pointed out that the determination, as George Romanoff and Joe Keffer mentioned, of the 15-day uh, transaction going into an undetermined status was not legal and did not comply with federal law. That letter also is attached to this record. Now, in 2006, I met in Representative Godshall's office with representatives of the state police um, and wherein I asked for a determination from Lieutenant Elias as to whether or not this matter had been resolved. And he said yes. I said, could you please show me that? He said, we don't release that. Um, I have a problem with that because he didn't give me an alternative or a procedure to acquire that information. And there's no transparency to the system. There is to the National Instant Check system. And that's why Congress has oversight over it. They've manda mandated that it have transparency. The other issues here are concealed carry permits. Joe Keffer and George Romanoff both mentioned that concealed carry permits would reduce the burden on every dealer in this state. And that's true. In my testimony, I point to the section of law that's being ignored. Now, law-abiding gun owners cannot ignore a section of law, but it is being ignored right now. George Romanoff and Buddy Savage from Braverman Arms both met with the state police, and they refused to comply with the law. I have a problem with that. So does our organizations. Mr. Stolfer, can you be specific as to which part that you believe is not being followed? Title 18, Section 6109G, Grant or Denial of License. Um, it says, upon receipt of an application for a license, I'm sorry. <laughs> You're basically saying that the law requires that if you are denied that there be a written response. Right. And, and, and are you saying that that is... Your, your experience is that that is not being provided? That's correct. Okay. And they're not, uh, uh, there's documentation to show the exact letter. They say that it's under, for an 
undetermined reason. And that, and that would come from the state police or the sheriff's office? Uh, it comes through the state poli or uh, the sheriff's office, but it's a result of the interaction with the state police as well. Okay, thank you. Senator Fontana has a question. I, yes, sir. I'm, when you're talking about accuracy compliance, I, I, I get a little, you know, the compliance maybe, but the accuracy issue, is there a difference? How do you know there will be a difference between the two, the pick and the, and the national and the, and the state? I mean, could, could it not also have issues with accuracy no matter what system? Would you, or how, how, would, how do you think, there, or how do you know there's a, 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 there is a difference or could be a difference? I'm not sure I follow you, Senator. What do you mean by accuracy? Well, you're saying that um, there's an accuracy issue with the, was a case number one that you yes. pointed out in, in, you know, I guess checking background and, and you're saying they're not accurate the way they check their backgrounds and things that they pull up. Is that is that what you're saying in case number one here? In what case I'm number saying, two? what I'm saying, Senator, is in the case number one, they made a determination that anything that could be considered to be a domestic violence issue or any type of incident without even a conviction uh, is considered to be domestic violence because of the connection and internet intersection with federal law that says that you cannot have a domestic violence conviction on your record. And that's what the state police determine in this situation. And you're saying that would be different with the other system? Or yes. You don't know that. How do you know that? Because, that? first of all, in case number one, Agent Fole was able to buy guns in Washington, D.C. He was able to buy them in Florida, Virginia, but not in Pennsylvania where he resides. Okay. So you, you and this record was available to them as well as it is to the... So you think that's an ongoing issue, the accuracy part, as you, as you stated, in case one with, with the system that's in Pennsylvania? I'm positive it is. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, sir. Mr. Stilford. Okay. Um, the, the, one of the other issues, too, is more of a subliminal issue, and that's the charges. Right now, a citizen has to pay $5 to exercise their constitutional freedoms. Murdoch versus Pennsylvania specifically stated that that's, you cannot charge for the exercise of a constitutional freedom. And the fees on the instant check system are projected to rise and have been negotiated with certain legislators up to the point of raising it to $20 per check. $10 for each side, the background check and the, and the other associated costs. Sorry. Um, the, um, the other area is, as Joe Keffer and George Romanoff talked about, is the impact on the Pennsylvania dealers where they've uh, seen a drop of almost 30 percent. But I, too, like George Romanoff and George, Joe Keffer, I also see and hear from gun dealers. And one of the things we do is we call dealers in other states, uh, Cabela's in West Virginia, Ohio gun dealers, uh, Southern Ohio gun, to see if the national instant check system is up and running. And invariably what we find is when a dealer has been shut down or put on a delayed status or they have employees waiting, the National Instant Check System is working fine. The manager of the Cabela's up here in Hamburg um, says that in the same times as you see in the material and testimonies submitted by George Romanoff, I called the manager up there and they said it looked like an amusement park. They had people going up and down aisles waiting to get the background checks completed. And they were just as frustrated as what you heard from George and Joe this morning. Now, the other thing is the overall costs. From what I can determine, provided my math is okay, this has cost Pennsylvania gun owners and citizens $87 million to run this system between creating it, the upgrades, and the yearly maintenance. And these are figures right from the state police. If we have, they've identified between 1998 and 2009, 95,234 individuals who are prohibited. But there haven't been those prosecutions. Why? If you're prohibited from possessing a firearm, the mere act 
of attempting to buy a firearm as a crime. Now, if we're interested in citizen safety, why are they lingering out there? These are questions that we have, and we keep asking, but we don't get answers. I've also provided a yearly breakdown from the uh, state police uh, data that's been supplied to the legislature and outlined it here under the investigations and the references to the ATF. And the reason I, I put that in there is because there's concurrent jurisdiction between the ATF and the state. If these people are uh, purchasing firearms and are considered to be criminals, then why are we not pursuing them and also in federal court and making those referrals? This is all that's been done. Now, we all walked down the street. Senator Tim Solovey was assaulted in his street. Uh, I've been in court and I've watched uh, criminals be turned away and not charged. But the system was designed to find the criminals. And if we're purchasing firearms and they're a prohibited individual, that's a crime right there. And that's why I felt that breaking this information down would be good for you to see. So in, in conclusion, I just want to point these things out. The vast majority of other states utilize the federal NIC system without these difficulties. Point of contact status that Pennsylvania maintains has been rejected by six states. Six or four full point of contact states and Georgia rejected it in 2005 and you've heard that uh, Oregon is considered changing it as well and as was as is Tennessee again and has only been adopted in two states and none in the last five years. The in check system we have now, PICS, is supposed to ensure that there's a responsible and respectful balance between the needs of public policy and the protection of our constitutional freedoms. I believe the testimony that is before you today demonstrates the PICS system is constitutionally, legally, and technologically outmoded and should be replaced by a better and financially more cost-effective approach the next system. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Mr. Stouffer. Do, do we have any further questions from the members? Senator Furlow. Uh, could you just clearly state the uh, position of yourself and others on the uh, Representative Stevenson bill? Are you, are you explicitly endorsing that? Or? We do support that as well. Yes, sir. And have you spoken? Where, where is that at in the House after educate me? Is your group lobbying on that with the House members? or? Yesterday we had, yes, we requested uh, individuals in the House to support that measure, yes. Do you know how many sponsors or if they've had a hearing yet? Sponsors, no, it's in the Judiciary Committee. Okay. Thank you. We're pretty much waiting, sir, for the uh, Castle Doctrine to be dealt with. Uh, thank you, Mr. Stouffer. A couple quick points. So in, the, in your uh, attachments, there are a lot of individual information. Um, do you have releases so that we can put this up on the website? Every one of the individuals there gave me their uh, verbal okay. Okay. I don't have written releases, but... I just want to make sure it's on the record. They did give me that. their authorization to use their material, including Agent Full. Okay. Second, um, if who, that person that called you during your testimony is important, you can tell them the reason you didn't answer is because you were testifying and that if they don't believe you, to look at the video at centerpippy.com. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you. Our final testifier is Major Scott Snyder, the Acting Deputy Commissioner of, the, of Staff, uh, and also Trooper Paul K. Anderson, the Supervisor for Firearms Administrative Section from our Pennsylvania State Police. Uh, gentlemen, it's always a pleasure to have you here. Thank you, sir. And look forward to your testimony. As was mentioned, I think, by a few of the members, you know, from a lot of our perspectives, this isn't about the state police as much as the functioning of this system that is under your authority. And I think we, it is important to differentiate that. And then the, uh, there is another uh, much larger philosophical debate as to the cost and you know, should we have it. But I th reading your testimony, I think you have some thoughts on that as well. Uh, we, have, we have a lot of supporters of our and troopers, men and women who serve, and appreciate the work you do on, every day. But if we can help make it better, 
Yeah, that's also one of our functions. So, gentlemen, please feel free to begin when you're ready.